good. It's a really nice day out today. How, everybody's in the back again. I don't know if it's my odor or my presence, or but uh, we're glad you're here. Um, God is, is glad you're here. You're not, you're not here by mistake this morning, so we welcome you. We're going to have fun today, and then we're going to preach the word, but um, I'm going to be honored. Uh, I guess we'll just rip right into it. I guess, I guess I should pray first. I'm excited about today, so if it, I, I seem like I'm out of whack, that's normal. Don't be afraid. If you're new here today, we welcome you. If you're old here today, we still welcome you. If you're middle-aged today, you are certainly welcome here. So uh, we're going to pray and ask God to come because what's the point in being here if he's not here? So we say good morning, Lord. And we say thank you for your presence, God. Thank you for your mercy, your grace. It's new every morning and we just celebrate it. We thank you for the change of season, the beautiful sunshine this morning, Lord. Thank you that you said let there be light because it sure is beautiful. So we just ask you to come and dwell with us and just fill this house with your presence this morning. We ask that your plans and your purposes be carried out by us. And Lord, I pray that uh, every word in here that's spoken this morning is from you and for you and, and edifying. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, we have something to do this morning um, as a body that is actually an honor. I'm going to ask the Bixler, Bixler family to come up right now. Wherever you are, I lost you in the back there. Um, it's one of our customs, and it's custom in a lot, a lot of churches um, to do... Uh, Dedication of children, and so I guess we'll come down here. I don't want to. I don't want you guys to get embarrassed or get nervous or anything. But um, you know, the scripture says um, quite a bit about children, and uh, I mean, I don't want to preach for a long time. I don't want you guys being up here. But today we get the honor of inviting this one into the family of God. You know, if you if you have kids, you understand the value of them being around the church, being being around godly people, being around godly wisdom and godly guidance. The scripture says it about the, the wisdom in putting a child in, an, in a sphere where there's godly wisdom and godly guidance. And so today, we're going to dedicate this young man to the church. But honestly, he's almost two. He really doesn't understand this. But this dedication is actually for you guys, for me, for us, and the family to say, hey, we're going to man up. We're going to put our big boy britches on. We're going to be part of this young man's life when he grows up. If I see him at the park doing something he's not supposed to do, in love, I'm going to say, hey, dude, I was there at your dedication. You shouldn't be doing that. In love. In love. And I know he doesn't understand it now, but it takes a community to raise a child. It, it, it really does. We were created to live in community. And so last night I, I texted you and, or whatever, and we, we found the meaning of his name. Manasseh, and it says the, the Christian, the biblical meaning of that name is the Lord takes my troubles away, and I thought that was pretty cool, and then uh, his middle name is Nathaniel, and so the biblical meaning for that is a gift from God, and if you know anything about the scriptures and what it says about children, it says the children are a gift from God, so today we celebrate that gift, and his last name, Bixler, means that his dad's last name is Bixler. That's spiritual, isn't it? <laughs> so, um, I'm going to invite the elders to come up and pray when elders are here. We're a little thin when elders so we'll, uh, lay a couple hands on these guys. If you would, come on up. And uh, we're just going to pray a blessing over him as we dedicate him to the body today. Alright, Father God, we thank you for this family, Lord. I thank you for their heart, their, their desire to raise this youngster in the church. Lord, today we dedicate him to you. God, he is yours. If where's anybody, he is yours. We thank you for that reality. Pray, Lord, that you would fill his parents um, with the desire to raise him, to know you, to love you, and to serve you. And I pray that us sitting here would take that responsibility on as well, and that reality of being part of his life, part of who he is as he grows. We thank you for his life, God. We thank you for the gift of this young man. And we praise you for the gift of life. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, people. 
blessed you guys. We welcome another one to this gang. Amen. They are cute. I, I never figured out yet how to get boys. <laughs> other, than, other than, well, if you have girls, eventually boys come around. I know. <laughs> Amen. Well, we're going to teach now. I'm going to release the children who are um, of age to go down with Brandy this morning. I'm gonna, we're going to teach first just today. I'm going to drop this word that, that God's been burning on my heart this week. Um, actually, in several weeks. So if your kiddos want to go down, they can go down with Brandy now. She's a certified teacher, so they'll really be spiritual when they come back up today. And I forgot to turn my teleprompter on. Does that mean... Wait, it's or is it on? It is on. Okay, cool. All right. We're going to pray again. Lord, we thank you for your word this morning, God. Um, Holy Spirit, we ask you to come. You are the teacher. We ask you to bring comfort, conviction. Lord, I pray that you would open up any revelations that we need to know about ourselves, our stuff, what you ask us to do, what you call us to do, our gifts and callings. Lord, I pray that those would be revealed this morning so that we walk out of here empowered to do your work that, that you created us to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. How many of you work? You don't need to stick your hand up. You have a job. You have a job to do. You're created by God to do work. God, everybody cheers. Yeah, it's, it's fun. Work is fun. It's just a ball of fun every day. It's just yay. You were created to glorify God. That, that's why you're on this earth. And it's work. And if you're here today and you belong to Him, if you said yes to Jesus, you have a job to do. You have a responsibility. It's, it's time for you to get to work. We know from the scripture that you can't work to receive the gospel. But the gospel will cause you to work. There's, a, there's something that we have to do as Christians. And it's not just... A, a box to cross off. We come on a Sunday and give him an hour of our life. We don't just or, or serve once or twice a month and just give and then sit on our hands and say, I did my part. I did my work. I'm done. This, that's not Christianity. It's not Christianity. It's not a Christ-filled life. It's not releasing the power that you got when you got the gospel. It's just simply not. I'm not trying to be mean this morning, but I do want to inspire you this morning. This idea of a Christian life is a lifestyle lived. It's not a box. It's not even just believing or receiving. It's a lifestyle. Lived. It's a game changer for you, hopefully, when you get it. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. This isn't, this is not really a fluffy word you want to say, but there's, there's, there's actually, there's actually a, 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 a groaning from creation longing from the glory of the sons of God, the scripture says. I know that's a mouthful, but what, I can simmer it down. There, there is a desire from the world in what you have. We say it a lot here at West End Grace, but it's true. The world desires what you have. They might not know it, but they do. So, Lord, can you put up 2 Timothy 4? Let's pray that things work this morning. We can look at that. <clears throat> so this scripture here, Paul's writing this. This is Timothy. 2 Timothy. Paul's writing this to Timothy. Paul was kind of Timothy's spiritual father. Timothy was kind of a spiritual son. He gleaned from Paul. Paul was like a big spiritual papa, and Timothy was like a child. In fact, it's, it said, my true child in the faith. And Paul exhorts Timothy to do this. He's like, but you be sober in all things. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. How many of you find that sometimes when you go to work, it stinks? I'll go over to this side. <laughs> sometimes your work is going to be hard. It's not going to be fun. It's going to be hard. And Paul's saying, listen, Timothy, be sober.
sober in all things. And not just sober, don't mean don't be getting drunk. Be sober of mind, be sober of spirit, be alert. We're told to, to not be in a fog. We're supposed to be alert and awakening to things, what's going on around you. When you're sober, you're aware of the things going on around you. You're aware of what people are doing, saying, thinking, and hearing. And if you were ever a party animal like me, when you're not sober, you're kind of out of it. And Paul's not just speaking to the idea of, of um, sobriety in, outside of substances. He's talking about a mindset of understanding, knowing what's going on around you, being able to connect engage and in love and he says and then by the way you're going to have to endure hardship he's not saying maybe hard times will come or maybe this won't be easy he's saying you're going to have to endure hardship when the scripture says endure hardship I'm not a theologian but I'm pretty sure that hardship is going to be part of your work to fulfill your ministry how many of you in here are preachers Every hand ought to go up. What does it mean to preach? It means to announce. That's what the word preaching means. It means to announce the gospel. But well, I'm not good at that. I'm not good at talking. Well, God didn't ask you to be good at it. He said do it. We'll get to more of that in a minute. God really revealed to me three things that that we need to do in order to do his work. And, and uh, we'll illuminate them scripturally, but if you're a note taker, there's three things we need to do. Number one, we need to know him. Number two, I forget what it was already. Oh, well, number two is we need to be able to connect with people. And three, we need to be able to love. Those three things are an absolute must to do the work of evangelist, to do the work of ministry. We have to be able to know him. We have to know him intimately. We have to be able to connect with people, and we've got to walk in love. What does he say in James 4, 7? Boy, I'm thirsty this morning. James, the guy that writes this, was actually the Lord's half-brother and was very resistant to the Lord for a, quite a long time. But he writes this after Jesus finally got through to him. He says, Submit, therefore, to God. Resist, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Is there another scripture there that there's... I, I must have goofed this up a little bit. There's, there's a scripture right there. I think it's 411 or something that says, draw, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. So what does that mean by drawing near to God? Many of you have kids in here this morning, and we just dedicated one to the church. When, when we're drawing near to God, we're getting to know Him. Okay? This, this whole idea of relationship is getting to know God. If I don't know God, I can't release God. If I don't know Him, I can't talk about Him. If I don't know His nature, how He acts, what His plans and heart is towards me, I can't mimic His nature. God always was about relationship from the beginning. So when I understand right relationship between me and God, I understand the idea of relationship because God is relational. So when I understand the idea of relationship and I'm in right relationship with him and God, I'm mimicking, mimicking the nature of God, which what I was created to do is mimic the nature of God. Does that, doesn't that kind of blow you away a little bit? You, you were created to mimic the nature of God. Why do I say this? Because Christ was perfectly manifest to God who he is. And I am a Christian. That means I'm a Christ-like one. That means I get to manifest the nature of God, which he always wants relationship. Guess who doesn't want relationship? Say, he hates it. He hates relationship. He hates intimate, beautiful connection between you and God. He hates beautiful, intimate connection between you and your spouse, you and your kids. And, and all of that is a form of godliness. Does that make sense? And so the enemy lives to uproot that relationship. He lives to uproot any, any kind of intimacy you have. The scripture says this in, in Genesis, that when Adam and Eve conceived, Adam knew Eve. And that word knew means an intimate relationship. He just didn't say, hey, that's a good looking girl. I guess I'll, for the sake of young ears, skip the next line. Uh, that looks good to me. No, the word there, 
there no means an intimate relationship. They, they were the only two on earth. It wasn't like they, Adam had a lot of choices or a lot of people to talk to, but he became intimate with her. They, they knew each other, and since I guess they were the only two on the earth, they thought it was a good idea to get connected. And guess what happened? Or, or you know, on down the road. But the, so that, that reality is that we need to know God in order to manifest his nature, his presence. Jesus spent a lot of time going away and saying, listen, I love you guys. I love to teach and preach and exhort and all those things and do miracles and all that stuff. But I, I have to take, Jesus says, i got to take some time and go up on a mountain because y'all are driving me nuts. The scripture doesn't say that. But what's the point? He needed to get connected to Papa. He needed to know him. I was talking, when I was talking to the Lord this week about this word, and he, I was reminded of the scripture so many times where Jesus said um, to the guy, the religious guy, he's like, what do I got to do to be saved? What do I have to do? And he said, you have to love God and love people. That's your job. I'm going to boil this down for you. Jesus had a habit of making it simple sometimes because we're kind of fuzzy headed. You know, uh, love God, love people. That's what I want you to do. And then I was asking, why do, we, why do we have such a hard time sharing our faith? Why do we have such a hard time loving people? Some of you in here have been through some inner healing and deliverance ministry. Um, it doesn't mean you're demon possessed. It means that there's things in your past that are suppressing you from living in love. And one of the things that I hear so much is I hear, I, I'm afraid of being rejected. I'm, ref, I'm afraid of not being accepted. And if you think about it in a spiritual sense, the idea of rejection is completely the opposite of love. The idea of not being accepted is being cast out from a place where you want to be desired. How many of you know it would be hard to come to God if he said, I don't want you? Think about it as a child, if you go to your parents. We watched a movie last night where the it was a heart breaking movie with terrible actors that the girl the teenage girl the parents split and her dad basically ghosted her and was like I don't want anything to do with you I'm busy with my new wife my new life my new house I don't want anything to do with you he said I, I'm rejecting you I can't imagine that man I, I, for me growing up I had a Cadillac father he just loved me just uh, just gave up so much he was drove truck and I, my hats are off to y'all truck drivers. I know we got a lot in here. It is not an easy task. It's work and it's long hours and it's a lot of crap you got to put up with. But I remember one night specifically, he came home on a Friday night and we would always want to go to the river in the summer down to our camper. And I'm like, he's laying on the couch and I knew his logbook. If he did not want DOT, he's seen his logbook, man. They're probably hauling him in because you know you got to sometimes. I'm preaching to the choir, <laughs> but the choir needs it, and I'm the choir too. But anyways, point with Dad's tired, man. He's like dead beat tired. He hits the couch and he's gone, and I'm like, dude, we really want to go to the river. And finally, I've been, I keep it three or four times. He's like, all right, all right. He's like, go load up the truck. You know what to do. You know where all the stuff is. I'll drive to the river. We load up the truck. Dad gets in the truck and uh, drive to the river. And as soon as we get to the camper, kablam, again. What's the point? I felt accepted by my father because I knew him. We had right relationship. With my children, I had a chat with them the other day about something that I wasn't going to make them real happy, but I said, listen, we have to have this talk. I celebrate my, that in my house because I have that relationship. We can talk about things. I know what makes them tick. I know what makes them happy. I know what makes them sad. I don't have to walk in fear of talking to my kids because I love them and we're in right relationship. That's what God wants. They know me and I know them. That's the idea. That's the same paradigm of me getting to know God. I have to know him in order to manifest him. I can know about him. I can know the Bible all I want. I can read this Bible till I'm blue in the face. But if I don't know the author, all I did was waste time and prepare myself to make a better argument for the case of Christ versus knowing the love of the Father and walking in joy and peace and comfort and commitment to my 
my Savior, where I manifest it without working for it. Does that make sense? I have to know him. One of the things I hear so frequently is I'm afraid of people rejecting me. I'm afraid of that. How many of you know that fear, fear itself is more damaging than what you're afraid of? FDR said it. He said, we don't, the, the fear, thank you, the only thing we have to fear is, is fear itself. He was right. My kids are ball players. Sometimes they strike out, and I can tell when they're nervous. I probably would be nervous too. I'm not a ball player. But I said, what, what's up? What's up? Oh, I'm scared of striking out. I know a lot of your ball players in here. How many of you know that that fear itself manifested and produced what you were actually afraid of? Did you catch that? This is an important thing for us to grip this morning. My fear of striking out, I was so nervous and uptight and I don't, I don't know who I am. If you're a ball player, then we need to get settled in being a ball player and say, you know what, I'm a hitter. And my kids are hitters. They are. That's who they are. But when they step to the plate and will come outside of their identity, be like, I'm scared, I'm terrified, I can't hit, I'm not going to do it, they're going to laugh at me, I'm going to reject it, all that stuff. Guess what that is? It's fear. And guess what it produces? The actual thing that we fear itself manifests. We see it in relationship all the time. I, I watched growing up as kids I went to high school with, it broke my heart, that are suppressed. They don't have a nice car. They don't smell good. They don't have nice clothes. They don't know the who's who's and what's what's. What do they have? A fear of rejection. What does it cause them to do? Cower in a corner. They don't go to events. They don't go to things. They're not... They're not socially accepted. They're not accepted in the, in the sphere. They don't go out. And so what happens? They become, I'm not, I'm not being judgy here, they become oddballs. And guess what happens to oddballs? They get rejected. Guess why? Their fear made true what they were most afraid of. Does this, is this connecting? So what they were most afraid of caused them to not do what they were unafraid of. How many of you know you'll never stay on by not worrying about falling off? Or you'll never stay on by being worried about falling off. Say some of us are, oh, I'm about ready to lose it. I'm going to lose it. I'm losing my stuff. And all of a sudden we're like, not too, we're too worried about hanging on that we do fall off. And why am I preaching this paradigm this morning, this idea this morning, is because that fear keeps us small. And we don't have the authority, we don't have walking authority to go out and connect with people because we're scared. How many of you know that Jesus had to connect with people before he had a ministry? That's why it's the second thing that I want to understand that when we're doing the work, we have to be able to connect with people. John, John, John 4, he does this, Lord, if you want to put it. John 4, I messed this up again. John 7, 9. I don't know what, I, that's not, that can't be right. That's not right. I'll just tell the story. It's in John 4. You just have to trust me. Jesus is walking along and it was one of the first things he did. No, this is not. We need to get this scripture up. It's John 4. He's walking along and he does something that was not normal. How many of you know Jesus did a lot of stuff that was not normal? It got him in a heap, man. The, the religious people were like, you can't do that. Jesus was like, yeah. <laughs> Watch me, I'm the son of God. Ooh, ah. Yeah. He makes the rules, not us. So Jesus, it's John 4, 9. <laughs> That'll be all right. It's John 4, 9. Jesus is walking along, and he, many of you know the story. He comes upon this Samaritan woman. Now, this was a, a Samaritan woman. He says, therefore, to the Samaritan woman, how is it that you, being a Jew, I'm going to slow down and back up a little bit. This is Jesus talking. This is exciting for me. It really is. Therefore, the Samaritan woman said to Jesus, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink since I'm a Samaritan woman? Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. She said that to him because she met him at a well. She met him at a well where she shouldn't have been at that given point in time because she was covered in shame. 
She met him at that well because she had been married four or five times. She had been rejected by her husband. In that time, culture, the husband had to release his wife. The wife, wife couldn't leave. The, the husband had to release her. So she didn't feel wanted. She feels rejected. She's going out to the well in an unlikely time to draw water, so she's not around a lot of people. They would typically draw water in the morning. It's cooler, and they needed water for the day. This woman, it's later in the day. The scripture says she's going out. She's hoping to not to run into Buddy. She's in one of those funks where she's like, I just want to go out to the store. I want to get my stuff. I want to go home. I don't want anybody to see me. I don't want any interaction. I'm having a bad day today. I'm an emotional wreck. Blah, blah, blah. Everybody thinks I'm, a, I'm weird, and I just want to go home. And Jesus is like, ha! I knew this from the beginning of time that I was going to run into you at this well. And he comes down, and he sits down, and this woman comes out to get the water. And he's like, hey, woman, give me a drink. It says it in verse before that. <coughs> hey, woman, give me a drink. And she'd be like, huh? Dude, I'm a Samaritan. You don't talk to me. The Jews and Samaritans were like, Crips and Bloods. All right? <laughs> Can we just go gangster for a minute? They were like, you don't talk to me, dude. Like, you're a Jew. At that time, the Jews were looked up as the church. That, that's the, church, the churchy people. And the Samaritans and the Gentiles were like the unholy people. They were the bikers. The creme de la creme, no offense. <laughs> they were the, the, those are those people. We don't talk to them. We don't go out with them. What are you, what are you talking to that person for? Even when the disciples came back, they're like, Jesus, why are you talking to this person? We don't talk to these people. They're weird. They smell bad. They're not the church. They don't look like us. They talk different, they act different, they don't have the same stuff, they don't know the scripture, they don't even have Bibles, most of them. And they surely didn't because Bibles were expensive. What are you doing talking to that woman? And Jesus is like, I'm going to show you something, peeps. You need to know how to connect to people that are different than you. You absolutely must learn that. I want you to be able to talk to people that are different than you, that look, that believe different than you, that act different than you, that smell different than you, that think different than you, that have a different color, they might come from a different culture, you don't like their music, you don't like their clothes, you don't like their, you know, what if God calls you to downtown Brooklyn tomorrow to be a missionary, and we're stuck in a redneck Snyder County spirit, and we're like, Psh. he has a habit of doing that, <clears throat> just saying. Some of y'all might want to get ready for it. We have to be able to connect with people. People is your work as a Christian. That is your work, people. That's what you're created to do. People. And when we can't connect with them, what good is it? You say, well, I don't know how to talk to people. I'm not good at it. I don't even like to read the Bible. I don't like to hear, I don't understand it. None of this stuff God's asking you to do, accept or like. He's telling you to do it. There's one, there's at least one more scripture I want to, And it's a hard one. It's First uh, John four eight. Hopefully, I got this right. And Jesus gives a command. I believe he actually means it. And, and we get real religious sometimes and say, "I have found in this book a whole bunch of things I'm not supposed to do, and I don't do them." I found in this book, I, I examine myself right now, and I have 613 or 47 laws in here in Leviticus, and I don't do any of those things. I'm in good shape. I'm packed up, prayed up, and ready to ship up. And yet I lack the ability to connect with people, to love on people, to actually manifest the kingdom. told this story before about a gentleman that I was around and he, and he 
told this story, and this man was a professing Christian, and he told this story about his former boss and how his former boss was going through a divorce. And his former boss didn't know the Lord. And so how do the people that don't know the Lord deal with things when they're going through a hard time? They go to their coping mechanism. This gentleman's ha thing happened to be alcohol. And so he was getting drunk a lot. Listen, I've seen people go through divorces. It is hell. It's just hell. But if you're here today and you're divorced, you're, there's no judgment coming from this place, I can tell you that. But it's hell. It's not pretty, man. So this guy, who didn't know any better, he's a worldly guy. What's he do? He goes out and gets drunk. And then this guy that's talking about him the next day or whatever, rolling down the road, says, Ha, 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 yeah, that's dummy. Oh, he's going through a divorce, and all he knows how to do is go out and get drunk. What an idiot. Ha, 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 moron. You don't know the Lord. And he's going on and on and on and on. And finally I said, so what happened when you witnessed to him? Because he's accountable as a Christian. He's accountable. That's a no-no. And I wasn't going to give him the rope of saying, well, why didn't you talk to him? Because the reality is he should have been witnessing to that man. And say, listen, yeah, he's going through a tough time. What did he say when you told him about Jesus and the hope you have? What his answer was? Well, he knows I'm a pastor. Who cares? They don't care what you know until they know you care. They don't. And that guy probably saw this guy be like, oh, is he, I'm going out and getting drunk. That's all I know how to do. Oh, I'm getting from Joe Schmo over here's judgment and self-righteousness and scorn. And instead of saying, dude, you're going through a rough time. I want to do it with you. I want to pray with you. Yeah, it's not okay to go out and get drunk. We know that. But that guy doesn't know any better because he got, doesn't know the Lord. He doesn't know him. And when he gets around someone that, prof that professes to do, and all he does is release judgment and crap over his life, guess what he thinks about God now? He thinks that God thinks that way about him. What's that going to do? Put him under more shame, more guilt, and, be, and to just be suppressed? I wanted to strangle that guy and be like, "What? where's your love, dude? That ain't love, baby. That's crap. It is the opposite of love. It's complete rejection. It's complete unacceptance. Why in the world would somebody want to keep, go after that spirit? And and first, and John he writes this: If you don't love, if you don't love people, you don't know God. You don't. If it is hard for you to love, ask yourself the question: Do I know God? If it's hard for you to serve. If you don't know, if you're walking, if you're new in Christ here today, you get a free pass. But if you're walking with the Lord 10, 20, 30 years, and you don't know your gift, and you don't know your calling, and you don't get your, know your ministry, do you know God? I, do you know Him? Because when my kids know me, they know what jobs I want them to do. When I tell them to do the dishes, they do the dishes because we know, I know them. They love me, and they respond out of relationship and not duty and religion and, and legalistic. You have to do this or else. They respond. They do something. How many of you know we can follow all the commandments in the book to the T and what would he do? But if we don't love, what are we doing? What, what's the point if we don't love? We follow all the don't do this, don't do that real good. But when it says go and preach the gospel, we're like, I don't want to do that. That's, that's hard. I might get hurt. I might get uncomfortable. Yeah, you will. But if I don't do it, it's just as sinful as if I go and do the things that he doesn't tell me to do. Whatever is not from faith is sin. If faith says go and preach the gospel to all the nations, then we ought to be picking up a weapon and man in a post. I, I, I'm, I'm at a point, I don't want to preach out of frustration, but there's people in this room that we don't know because after church, we're not intentional about connecting with them, getting to know them, building the body, having connection, having fellowship. And if we can't do it in our walls, how are we going to make connection outside our walls? This is the safe place in here. The water's warm. It's comfy. It's cozy. If I can't do it here, God knows I can't do it out there. So my question is, do you know him? Because when you do, this will happen.
happen. This is God's word. Do we believe it? Or is it just something we're going to say, yeah, I believe it, and we'll go out the door today, and I put it in my eye. You were born for love. Because God is love, and you were born for him. You were born for people, because they're his creation, and we love everything that he created because he said it is good. It's tough. And you know what my spirit did with that guy that made fun of the guy that got drunk? I wanted to knock his socks off. But I can't. i got to respond to him in love. And my heart broke for that guy because he's missing something. I'm not being judging. I can't. It's an observation. Listen, if you're around someone that's mean like that, it's not, it's not judgment, guys. It's observation. You know, Jesus wasn't judging the Pharisees. He's like, y'all are a jacked up religious mess. I ain't no love. And I ain't hanging out here. You know, you have permission to not hang out places where it's ugly and dark. Doesn't mean that God might not call you to that. But you have permission to be like, I, I can't. There's not love here. There's, in fact, there's evil here. And I have to back out. He just did that sometimes. of you have a plan. You're going to get up at 5 or 6 or if you're a truck driver you're going to get up at 2 or 3 in the morning you're going to make a cup of coffee and you might put on your favorite song listen to that or whatever and then you go to your job and, and you have an expectation of what you're going to do, who you're going to meet, who you're going to see what you're going to be doing the rest of the day and when you come home you have a plan what I'm getting at is this do we have a spiritual plan for the work God has intended us to do tomorrow the next day? What's our plan? Does it include him? I hear this oftentimes from people who are struggling in their faith. What's your time with Jesus like? What's the last thing God's working in your life? Are you praying? Are you praying with your spouse? No, 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 and no. And I said, well, then you're not getting to know God. I'm not trying to be mean. I'm just trying to be real and honest. And we don't spend any time with him. We don't know him. We don't know him. We can't be him. That's how this works. There's a great, great, beautiful thing in relationship. And all you are married and are in it and have enjoyed it, get it. Or if you're in love with Jesus, you get it. It's time to release it. Lord, we thank you for your word this morning. Holy Spirit, I ask that you get it settled on us that this is what you want from us. And it's hard, and it doesn't uh, look appetizing, but it sure is good. something in your heart, if the Holy Spirit's digging at you and saying, I don't know about all this. If you're at that point where you're on the fence, or you've never given yourself, or you don't know what it's like to know God, I'm going to pray for you.
That's why we're here. And if we can't pray in here, if you can't receive, if you can't humble yourself in here to receive prayer, then you need to pray for humility. I'm just being honest. This is this is where we get edified. This is where we get built up. So we're going to do some worship, and I encourage you to go back there if, if uh, you need prayer for anything. We're going to pray for you. This is not a place of judgment. We're not here to see about your stuff and point it out. That's not that's not what we're about. So, Lord, if you want to roll some worship, we're going to worship and see what God wants to do with the rest of this. We're in, we're in a season where the Lord wants to do something new. That's his nature, that's his desire, that's his heart. And if you wonder why we're singing about wine in church, Jesus said this, he says, you don't put new wine into old wine skins, or the old wine skins will burst, because they couldn't handle his newness. They, weren't, they didn't have the capacity to receive it. That's why he didn't go to the old church. They didn't receive him. That's why they crucified him. And he said, I am the new wine. He is a new work, and he wants to do a new work in you today. And he's looking for those who are willing. He's not looking for those who are perfected. He's not looking for those that have it all together. He's looking for those who are willing. So that new wine will come out of you. New life, new light, new hope, new love. That's what he wants to do in this season, this hour, and this year. I'm going to pray a blessing on you guys and release you. And, and uh, I just pray that you have a blessed week. Um, we're probably going to let this song play softly in the background. If you want to stay in worship or stay in prayer, you do what you want. But we're going to use it as our offering song. The offering bucket is here. Um, I ask that you, you pray over your gift, your tithes, your offerings. Ask God to multiply. It's his money. It's not ours. It's his anyways. So, Lord, we thank you for your word this morning. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your people, God, and your body. Lord, I pray your blessing over each one of us in here this morning. That as we go this week, that we're empowered, that new wine comes out of us, new life, new love, new things. And yes, it's going to be hard. We never call us to stuff that's easy, but it's rewarding. We pray that you would empower each one in here today. The Holy Spirit, you would seal the word spoken in here today over these people, over your body, that we would walk in power, that we would walk in life and light. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Love y'all. Thanks for being here this morning. We'll see you next week, Lord willing, here, 10 o'clock, West End Grace. Tell a friend. Tell a neighbor. Find someone goofy and invite them. It shouldn't be hard to do.